News Talk On Demand. Interruption-free audio where you want it, when you want it. I'm drawing warmly. Good to have you here and hope your Saskatchewan day is going this morning exactly the way it should. Shorter week than usual, of course, with Good Friday. Uh, we're not going to be on the radio program, so as I've been reminding you, we're going to squeeze into four days this week. Enough conversation, passion, curiosity, and your feedback to get everything done that we need to. Well, long before there was gluten-free everything, there was Shelly Case, registered dietitian from Saskatchewan, whose timing was impeccable. In 2001, again, long before the gluten-free craze, she wrote a book called Gluten-Free Diet, a Comprehensive Resource Guide. And that was in the spring of 2001. Because the concern over celiac disease and, of course, the need for gluten-free food motivated her at that time and as now to help people through what they should know about gluten-free foods. Then, of course, in the ensuing 16 years, the world has gone absolutely crazy over gluten-free diets, which has brought Shelley Case even more fame, acclaim, and busyness than she uh, already has. So the newest edition of Gluten-Free, the Definitive Resource Guide, is out. And this being the fifth edition, and when an edition comes out, that means there's been improvements and changes. Uh, God only knows the number of printings uh, over all of these years. So with this new fifth edition, there are additional uh, recipes, information, and more importantly, Everything you need to know is a resource guide on all things gluten-free. We find Shelly Case in her home base of Regina this morning. Hey, it's good to have you back, my friend. Thanks so much, John, for having me on your show again. Um, I, I was laughing because I remember when this first came out, you were just, a, you intersected perfectly with so much attention on gluten-free. Yeah, it was interesting when I told people about my book and about celiac disease and gluten-free, we had a lot of the deer in the headlight looks. And of course, now, fast forward 16 years later, it's everybody asks me, oh, gluten-free is healthy or I should go gluten-free. Is it good for you? So we've really swung the pendulum from not knowing about celiac disease to everybody thinking gluten is going to cure what ails you. And as a registered dietitian and author, let's, let's tackle that one first. Is gluten, the, uh, gluten-free the healthy, it's going to cure everything that ails me kind of diet? No, it's not. Really, uh, gluten, the gluten-free de- diet is designed for people that need to follow it for a medical, out of medical necessity. And those two groups of people are those with celiac disease and a phenomenon we call non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So there's research showing that it's possible to be sensitive to gluten and not have celiac disease, but we're still working more on the mechanisms and the pathophysiology behind what's causing that. But really, celiac disease is what I want to focus a lot on today because we estimate that even though it affects about 1% to 2% of the population, we estimate that about 90% of the people that have the disease are walking around undiagnosed, being told it's irritable bowel, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, ulcers, it's all in your head. They go see different specialists and they get prescribed different medications, but nobody is able to put, connect the dots and realize that this is actually celiac disease, which is a serious autoimmune disorder. Shelley Case, Regina-based dietitian, international expert on celiac disease, and now a fifth edition out of her best-selling book, Gluten-Free, The Definitive Resource Guide. Hey, anytime Shelley's here, it's always good, too. You have questions? You want to join the conversation? Shelley will be with us until the bottom of the hour. So quickly call now at 1-877-332-8255. Get your question answered. We're talking gluten-free. We're talking celiac disease and those related issues. You know, you talk about the uh, confusion or the lack of diagnosis. I know even in my own life, I've had three or four friends who for years had exactly that. Well, your gut's acting up, you know, you've got irritable bowel. All of a sudden, they get the diagnosis of celiac disease or or an intolerance, and it's like turning on a light. It, It explains everything. It's a huge, huge game changer because a lot of the symptoms 
that people have that really affects their quality of life. I mean, some of the common symptoms of celiac disease are gastrointestinal issues, so abdominal pain, bloating, gas, diarrhea or constipation, nausea. They can even throw up and they get really sick. But the, what's interesting is this disease, because it's an autoimmune disease, gluten, which is the protein in the grains, wheat, rye and barley, this gluten protein causes damage to the lining of the small intestinal tract, so you're not able to absorb a lot of your nutrients. So that's why people can become very fatigued because they develop iron deficiency. Uh, other symptoms that people can have are um, dental enamel defects, uh, they can get osteoporosis, bone and joint pain, they can have canker sores, um, easy bruising of the skin, muscle cramps, mood swings, depression, migraine headaches headaches, um, infertility, uh, neuropathy, which is that tingling and numbness in the hands and feet. And in some people, they get this itchy, blistering rash that looks like herpes or uh, chicken pox, and it's called dermatitis herpetiformis, which is the skin presentation of celiac disease. So when you hear the, the multitude of symptoms that people can have, and they vary from person to person, you can see why it's very difficult for physicians to make that diagnosis because my gut aches, my head aches, my joint aches. So that's why we really have to do a huge awareness campaign, and we've been trying very hard on the Canadian Celiac Medical Board, which I'm on, to, to educate physicians and dietitians to know what to look for and get people diagnosed. That's amazing, all because of a plant-based protein allergy. All of those kind of symptoms. Well, it's not allergy. It's not an allergy. It's not like when you have a peanut, um, when you eat peanuts, and it causes this, this reaction. This is different. This is an autoimmune disease, like multiple sclerosis and uh, Sjogren's syndromes and Crohn's. And what happens is the body starts attacking its own tissue, uh, rather than uh, fighting off the bugs and viruses, uh, which it's designed to do. For some reason, when they consume a, a normal, naturally uh, occurring protein like gluten, it causes the body to turn on itself. So the only treatment for this disease is to strictly avoid all forms of gluten. And that's where it gets very challenging because gluten is in a lot of things. And that's why I wrote my book to help people know what they can and can't eat and how to eat healthy on a gluten-free diet. Shelley Case is with us, Regina-based registered dietitian, international best-selling author. The well-known book that first came out 16 years ago, uh, now in a fifth edition, a fifth redo, printed many times over, is called Gluten-Free, The Definitive Resource Guide. Uh, questions for Shelley, it's one 332 8255 Okay, now that you've disabused me, and I shouldn't have used the word allergy. Um, but, <laughs> Sorry, John. No, no, that's good, though, you. because I, I labor under that same thing, that, you know, that, that somehow this is just like an allergic reaction. So thank you for that. Um, what do we most commonly find gluten in? And then the second question is, what are the surprise things where we think we're not going to get gluten and we do? Great question. Well, these, you know, the obvious sources of, of gluten are the breads and the pastas and cereals and other baked products. Uh, but, you know, it, it, they can use uh, wheat and especially wheat and barley uh, as ingredients in a lot of other foods. So even something like a corn or rice-based cereal, you may think, well, that's okay, but it often has a barley malt flavoring to crisp it up and give it the flavor. Soy sauce, well, you think that's okay on your rice. That sounds gluten-free. Some soy sauces are a combination of wheat and soy. Many salad dresses, uh, salad dressings, marinades and sauces, seasoning blends, uh, soups, uh, uh, meats, like processed meats, uh, uh, beef, fish, or chicken burgers, even uh, vegetarian burgers, they often add extra wheat gluten to increase the protein content. Many of your snack foods and chocolate bars and chocolates and licorice, some flavored herbal teas, and of course, beer, ale, and lager is made with barley, and because it's only fermented and not distilled, that contains gluten. So a lot of um, things have gluten in it. Wow. Stand by. Shelly Case returns. We're going to talk more about managing a gluten-free diet. And all of this began, and uh, Shelly's really up front, the craze of saying, well, I'm eating gluten-free because it's healthier and it's everything else. No, not necessarily so. She began this as a campaign on celiac disease, which, as she explains, is one of, while it's a small number of people diagnosed as having it, many, many people uh, who have a form of celiac disease and or some kind of gluten reaction 
who go years without diagnosis. So how do you do the diagnosis? How do you find this out? That'll be my next question to Shelley Case, author of Gluten Free, the Definitive Resource Guide. one 332 8255 If you have a question, here on 650 CKOM and 980 CJME. I'm drawing warm with Shelley Case is here, registered dietitian, Saskatchewan-based author, international bestseller, gluten-free, the definitive resource guide, out in a fifth edition. Uh, you can get the book in better bookstores everywhere and at Shelley Case, and Shelley has an E-Y, ShelleyCase.com. You can learn more about that. We'll talk about a little bit more of where you can find the book, too. Uh, so testing, Shelley. One of our listeners uh, says, uh, everything you've described sounds just like me. How does a guy get tested? Great question. Well, as I mentioned, there's so many different symptoms, and so that's what makes it so hard to get diagnosed. But the first step is that we have a, a screening test. It's a blood test that is looking for these gluten antibodies. It's called tissue transglutaminase, or TTG for short. So what they do is they look in to see if that uh, is elevated, and if it is, then they um, send you for a small intestinal biopsy. It's much nicer than the colonoscopy. You only have to fast for 12 hours. They spray your throat with a little freezing, put a scope and a camera down into your stomach and, and the first part of your small intestine, take some biopsy samples, and look to see if those villi, which are the um, absorptive surfaces of the small intestine, are damaged. So those are the two uh, ways. The first step is the blood test and then the biopsy. But I want to say that um, if you go on a gluten-free diet and you've been on it for a while, before you have those tests done, when you go to have them done, they can be falsely negative because you have to have gluten in your system for those tests to be accurate. So if any of the listeners today think that this might be what they need to do, I highly recommend they go get tested first, go see their doctor, and then follow up with a registered dietitian who can help you follow that gluten-free diet um, uh, healthily. So, so when you talk about eating healthy, and I know in your book you've got a number of recipes and cooking hints, but eating healthy and eating gluten free, it's not always completely compatible. How do you how do you make them work? Well, that's a very good point. One of the challenges is that many of the gluten free products are made with uh, white rice flour, tapioca, corn, and potato starches, which are very low in fiber and iron and B vitamins. They're not your stellar nutrients. And so just because it says gluten-free uh, doesn't equate equal. So you, I, you need to look at the list of ingredients. And fortunately, I've been really working with a lot of companies and, and sort of preaching the importance of using um, uh, more healthy ingredients in their gluten-free products. So things like gluten-free oats, Almond flour here in Saskatchewan, our pulses are dried beans, peas, and lentils. Uh, looking for things like quinoa, sorghum, amaranth, uh, you know, brown rice. Those are ingredients rather than buying just the, the white rice bread, which is not very nutritious. So, and then, and building your diet on naturally gluten free foods. So things like your um, nuts and seeds, your, your pulses, fruits and vegetables, eggs, you know, your meat, fish, and poultry, seafood, yogurt, cheese. Those are sort of how you build your diet. You start out with eating healthily, and then you can add in, if you need a gluten-free cereal or a pasta or something as a substitute, then you can add those in. But don't just, if you're going to eat gluten-free cookies and white rice-based um, bread and some pasta that's just made with white rice, it's not a very good diet. And in fact, many people eating a gluten-free diet are low in fiber and iron and B vitamins because of that very reason. Dietitian Shelley Case, the book is Gluten-Free, The Definitive Resource Guide. And now, you mentioned contamination, and there's an interesting project, and here, of course, in the heart of farm country, gluten-free oats. Are oats naturally gluten-free anyway? Yes. I mean, for years we thought that oats caused the same reaction as the wheat, rye, and barley. But in investigating further, we found out that it was the fact that the oats were really contaminated with wheat or barley because typically as our farmers here in, the, in Saskatchewan and the prairies rotate the crops to prevent, you know, weeds and, and problems and pests. So one year they might grow wheat, and then the next year they grow oats. You will get volunteer wheat popping up in that crop. If they put it in the same bins where there was wheat or in the truck in a truck where there is um, wheat, rye, or barley, for example, two to three kernels of, of, of wheat or barley in, in a kilo of oats, which is about 20, 25,000 kernels, just two to three of those in that kilo can trip it over 
20 parts per million, which is the regulatory threshold for gluten-free. So uh, that's why it's interesting. I've been involved with some companies over the years and right here in Saskatchewan to get them going so that they could um, um, develop uh, a gluten-free oat product that was done with farmers where it's grown on dedicated land using dedicated equipment and processed in a a gluten-free facility so that when it says gluten-free oats, we know those are not just your regular oats. They're oats that are not contaminated and uh, can be safe for people with celiac disease. Isn't that something? Shelly Case is here. The book is gluten-free. Okay, before I let you go, uh, I talk about contamination of oats and, and, and grains. Contamination in restaurants, is that a big issue too? Oh, that's our biggest hurdle that we are dealing with right now for all across North America. A lot of restaurants say we have a gluten-friendly, a gluten-wise, uh, we have gluten-free options. But the, it's one thing to have the, the naturally gluten-free foods available, but how does it get prepared? And especially in the back of the ki- a busy kitchen, if you use the same tongs to flip, say, your chicken breast and, or it's been on the grill with a steak where they've grilled, say, um, put garlic toast there before, for uh, all those things, it only takes a few crumbs, a small amount of gluten, and it can cause a lot of problems and symptoms for people. So we, we need to do some more work in educating our chefs and restaurants on how to pro, uh, provide safe, uh, gluten-free foods for, uh, for consumers. I usually recommend, and I have celiac, so I, um, I'm always in the back asking the chef or the manager more questions, um, but is going to dine early. If you, if you go to a restaurant, a busy restaurant on a Saturday night at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, the kitchen is slammed. So I always say go early. Everything's clean before they've had a chance to have other things um, being prepared. And I have lots more tips in my book on how to eat out safely. Or if you've been invited to somebody's place and you're not sure that they can do it, I always suggest just bring a dish that you know is safe so if at least there's nothing there that you can have, you've got something that you've prepared. So those are just a few tips, but there's, there's so many more things. And I could talk about gluten-free for for hours, as you know. Dietitian Shelley Case, international best-selling author. The book is Gluten-Free, the Definitive Resource Guide. Boy, it's great to see uh, the attention this thing uh, continues to get. Uh, you've got these books, of course, available in good bookstores everywhere. Where can uh, people pick them up? They can pick them up in, in Regina and Saskatoon in Chapters or the Cole Store, uh, McNally Robinson in Saskatoon and Winnipeg. And then from my website, Shelley Case, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y, C-A-S-E dot com. And I've got a special going on today. You can get free shipping. So order the book and uh, learn more about celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, and how to eat a healthy gluten-free diet. It's really designed for consumers, dietitians, physicians, chefs, or anybody else that needs to to know how to uh, follow a gluten-free diet safely. You have done an amazing job on this, my friend. Thank you so much, and uh, continued success, Shelley. We'll talk again. Thank you so much for having me on the show, John. Shelley Case, in Regina, registered dietitian, expert on celiac disease, and international best-selling author on... This is the fifth edition of Gluten-Free, the definitive resource guide, been printed many times, and as, of course... Uh, and I always laugh. When she came out in 2001, this is a woman with celiac disease who's really concerned about celiac and gluten-free. Then all of a sudden, the world goes crazy after this book's out on everything's gluten-free. And of course, including a lot of pop diets that really have nothing to do with your health. But it's all about celiac disease and gluten intolerance. And she continues to inform and advise so well. And she's one of us from Saskatchewan. I'm John Gormley on 980 CJME and 650 CKOM. John Wormley, city councils, as you know, affected by a cut by Sask Power and Sask Energy. And it's only those two crown corporations. Uh, SGI, SaskTel, continues to pay all the money they pay to municipalities. But for some reason, these two crowns in the budget decided to save $36 million, affecting 108 different municipalities by saying, we're not paying the Grand St. Lou. Now, a lot of this is pretty confusing because we've always thought grants in lieu mean grants in lieu of property tax. But so you've now got the very real effect, and remember, this is on the province. Cities of Saskatoon and Regina both will be out about $11 million. So of that $36 million, about 22 of it is dispersed between the two big cities. So they're each out $11 million. Because of the calendar year versus the fiscal year, this year, it'll be about eight and a half to nine million. 
So both city councils in Regina and Saskatoon have been meeting to try and find a way to each find eight and a half to nine million dollars. Regina City Council has spoken about raising taxes uh, as much as two and a half percent. Saskatoon's been under one percent. But in any event, both municipalities have also been talking about finding savings. Donna Harpower uh, joined us earlier in the show, and I wanted to replay this. She's the minister responsible for government relations. And we began the interview by asking her, so what is the status now for this coming year of these grants in lieu? So the misconception is that this particular grant in lieu in Sask Energy and Sask Power is a payment for ta- property taxes based on assessment of the property, and it just isn't the case in Sask Power and Sask Energy. These are historic agreements that go back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and there is a lot of inequity in them in that, as you pointed out, 108 communities receive them, but no other, all of the other communities do not. So when we're looking at efficiencies and, and fairness, and of course we're looking at revenues for uh, to backfill our resource revenue shortfall, we were looking at everything, and this program perhaps needs a, needs a lens on it um, because of it, its inequities, and it doesn't address what, what the perception is, which is property tax. We agree that we should be paying property tax, and in all of other executive government, as well as all of the other crowns, their grant in lieu are based just on that. Um, I know so, so, so just so Sask, so, so Sask Power and Sask Energy, their grant in lieu is beyond property tax? What it's based on is usage, quite frankly, John. So as the usage goes up or the city gets bigger, they get more money. <laughs> usage, usage of? Of energy. Okay, so this, so now when you talk about usage of energy by the city or by the the crown, I mean, explain how that works. Oh, it's by the city or the town that receives it. So where the inequity is, for example, if you go down Highway 16, the town of Lanigan receives this. If you go a little further, the town of Viscount does not. You go a little further, Kalonzi does. Like there, it is very random. Um, as to who signed the agreements back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and who did not. Okay, so this also covers, as I understand, some communities, but not all, that used to have their own power generating, sold out over the years to Sask Power, and this is like a continuing kind of payment or subsidy. Well, that's where it gets really confusing, John, because there's also a Sask Power surcharge. So back in history, when a Crown Corporation were formed, um, there is a surcharge that flows to our cities to compensate them for not having a power power utility company. So Kurt and Saskatoon maintained their companies. The other cities did not. So the surcharge, which is still flowing and will be about $74 million this year, is is kept whole in this budget, and it is the holder of the historic agreement. Okay, so you pay what we as subscribers pay a surcharge, and that money goes back to the cities? Correct. And that still is going to be paid to the cities? Correct. Okay, so you've got this this question or this definitional challenge of what's a grant in lieu when it involves these two crown corporations? Correct. Okay, so is this a one-off only this year? They're not going to pay that? Or is this a reconstituting or a redefining going forward that they're not going to see that money? For sure we're going to have the conversation, but I believe that we need to have all of our crowns pay grants in lieu based on assessment of property times the mill rate, just like executive government and the rest of the crowns. So will it come back somewhat uh, if, it, if it's redesigned to be what, what people understand it to be? Um, then we're going to be doing assessments, of course, on, on government buildings and paying taxes accordingly. But this extra kind of grant in lieu that clearly uh, company, you know, cities are paid because they don't own a power company, cities are paid based on the amount of power they use, that's off the table now. You're going to change that. I think we're going to be changing that. Of course, we'll have the conversation in the coming year for the next budget. But I think it is a very unfair and equitable program. Um, the history of the Crown Corporation South Power being formed is held in the surcharge, which is held whole. Um, 
I think we need to look at this strange program um, that basically Sask Energy wasn't even in existence at the time. And I believe this probably came about when Sask Energy and Sask Power divorced. Okay, so this, what I'm hearing you say, is really another form of revenue sharing with certain municipalities. With certain municipalities, yes. My understanding from reading the agreements that it was an agreement to pay a percentage of the usage. Usage in those of cities? The, of the energy or the power. Okay, this is very confusing, and do you think the public is owed a far better explanation than we've received? You know, we've explained it a number of times, and of course the immediate perception as soon as you hear grants and Lou is that it's property tax uh, based on assessment and the mill rate of the respective community. We've sent messaging out that that's not the case, but the confusion still remains, and, and it is a very complicated program. It is indeed. So uh, what's the next step for your government in dealing with the municipalities, uh, Donna Harpower? Well, I mean, the municipalities obviously are, are very angered. Um, there's been a lot of strong language used, and um, they've basically most recently said the partnership's over. And I have to question a partnership that's one-sided as long as we continue to give. There's a partnership, but when we have to ask for restraints, there is no partnership. Um, that's disappointing, but we will still continue to have those conversations. Good having you here, Minister. Thanks for this. You bet. Take Don care. Donna Harpower, the Minister of Government Relations, was here earlier this morning. I wanted you to hear that. You know, the weird part about communicating anything in life is if people cannot clearly understand what you are trying to tell them, it's not their fault. Now, you can say it is. You can say, well, people just don't get it. Uh, some of the municipalities are deliberately perhaps being obtuse. doesn't matter. If you cannot explain something clearly enough that the average person goes, aha, got it, it's your problem. And the minister, if you listen really carefully, you can get what she's trying to explain. But this entire grants in lieu issue involving just two crown corporations. The only two are SAS Power and SASC Energy. Why? Because the rules are written differently for them. Has anybody ever told you that before? No. Has anybody explained it satisfactorily? No. Did Donna Harpower explain it satisfactorily there? No. Memo to Brad Wall. Explain this better. Lay it out and let people know exactly what's being debated. But boy, this has been just... Such an uphill pull for people who are trying to understand what any of this means. I'm John Gormley. So we know, and I'm not really waiting as breathlessly as some of you may be, for Thursday's announcement, the tabling of a bill that will formally legalize marijuana in Canada. Only one other country on planet Earth has a national legal regime for marijuana, Uruguay, yeah, Uruguay and Central America, and us. Every other place will do it, certain city ordinances, maybe certain states, certain districts. But no, the second largest landmass on planet Earth, Canada, will be a fully legal marijuana country. So all of that's going to be laid out when the bill is tabled on Thursday. But there are a couple of people saying, watch out on two fronts. Age, and what you're going to pay for pot. That story next on 980 CJME and 650 CKOM. I'm John Gormley. Oh boy, how stupid do you have to be? I've been to Montevideo in Uruguay in South America. Sorry, I was thinking as you go along Central. No, it's down there clearly in South America. Yeah, I am a smarty pants, or as one guy called it, sporty pants. Yeah, I'm so smart. I can argue geopolitics with you, and I can't tell you where a country is. Okay, so Uruguay is significant for this whole issue because it's the only country on planet Earth. And if you look at Uruguay compared to us, where it sits in South America, its size, all else compared to Canada, 
you're doing completely apples and oranges. But it's the only country that has fully legalized marijuana until Canada wants in. So Mr. Trudeau is going to table, and what's called first reading is when a bill is tabled in the Commons. That's going to happen Thursday. Uh, We are not going to be here Friday, so we'll be talking about it, I'm sure, next week with a lot of different legal advisors and experts. But the advice is coming now, fast and furious. For example, what should the minimum age be to buy and consume pot? The Ann McClellan report, Ms. McClellan, as you will remember, a former justice minister in the Cretchen days, was pretty clear that it should be at least what the respective provincial ages are on consumption of alcohol. Now, in that case, as you go patchwork across the country, I think we're at about, okay, we're 19, Alberta, 18, 19 in BC, so it's 18, Alberta, 18, Manitoba. I think there's only three provinces in Canada that are still at 18. So overwhelmingly, the liquor consumption age in Canada is 19. In Saskatchewan, six other places. So the federal law will perhaps say it is 18 subject to any province wanting to make it higher. One writer, a guy named Jim Warren, who's a liberal strategist, comes out and says, and I thought this was really interesting, it should be at least age 21. Why? We in Canada have been trying to deal with this whole question of youth marijuana consumption. So the higher you can make it, the further you make a bridge or the further the length is between legal consumption and youth. Although it is funny. Uh, Let me just parenthetically say, the Ann McClellan Task Force dealt with adult at 18. Do you remember the federal government recently, and we were just laughing about that whole gun, that phony gun law thing where the United Nations says youth are up to 24? Well, just want to keep it real, all you public health people who say, well, I believe in everything the World Health Organization does, the UN does. Well, if youth is up to age 24, marijuana, my friend, should only be for adults, 25 and over. By the way, I don't believe that, but I just said it to incite you if you're one of the uh, public health types. But Andrew Murray, who's the CEO of Mad Canada, he says the problem with 18 or even 19 is you run the risk of normalizing marijuana for teens because everybody's got a buddy who's 18 or 19. They'll look after getting it for you. And given the developing young brain... There's a very good argument, and the amount young people are driving. Andrew Murray says there are many, many arguments for science and research supporting a higher age limit, probably 21. So Mr. Trudeau got elected because he was going to legalize pot. I believe there were many other reasons, but he, he will tell you it was his brave legalizing pot that now makes him prime minister. So you can't turn the clock back on that. But you can say, what's your age going to be, Prime Minister? So even people like Jim Warren, prominent liberal, says, make it 21. You think? 1-877-332-8255. Now, here's a more interesting one. Study coming out today. C.D. Howe Institute, this is a think tank on all matters economic, and this actually confirms what my spidey senses have been telling me all along. Some of you believe one of the reasons Mr. Trudeau is so cavalier with the deficit, like, I am going to run a $10 billion deficit twice, maybe three, I don't know. Oh, $27 billion? Yeah, okay, whatever. We're talking 2028, by the way, before the government stops running deficits. But some of you think, once we legalize pot, kapow, can you imagine the revenue hit? Well, the C.D. Howe Institute says legalized cannabis, if you took combined federal and provincial existing sales taxes, would raise about $675 million a year, which isn't much money. Oh, no, we're raising over a billion and a half just in Saskatchewan on our sales tax. So nationwide, they're only talking $675 million on pot. But here's the other issue. 
if you start to put a special tax on marijuana, which they're going to do, so there'll be GST and PST on marijuana, but then there'll be like a federal sin tax. So let's say nine bucks a gram. Hmm. Then you put PST because, I mean, the government is going to be setting a pretty big tax on this stuff. Here's the problem. The C.D. Howe Institute says you've got to be very careful on pricing because once you get a price legislated by government from seed to sale, THC levels legislated by government, sellers, buyers, producers, uh, growers, once the price gets to a certain point above what the market will bear, you know all the people you buy pot from now, they're going to continue to sell you pot. So this idea of a government windfall might be premature. But some like CIBC World Markets, they think it could be $5 billion a year in pot. I mean, once you add all the taxes on, but keep an eye out for this. The pricing is going to be critical. I'm John Gormley. We're going to talk to a guy next who makes the neatest stuff you're ever going to see. You remember all the N- Nintendo stuff you played with as a kid? He'll make you a desk and furniture that looks exactly like Mario's right there. And he's one of us, Regina guy Jeremy Regeer, founder of Big Time Furniture, next on 650 CKOM and 980 CJME.